and welcome to the Books on Asia podcast, sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of fine books on Asia for over 30 years, located at www.stonebridge.com. And I'm your host, Amy Chavez. And today I'm talking with Robert Weiss from the Natural History Museum in Luxembourg. Robert is a paleontologist and curator of the exhibition called Spirit of Shizen, The Nature of Japan Through 72 Seasons, to be held at the Natural History Museum this summer, 2022. He has also put together a exhibition catalog called Shizen, The Nature of Japan Through Its 72 Seasons. And today he's going to talk about putting together the anthology as well as putting together the exhibit at the museum in Luxembourg. So, welcome Robert. Yeah, hi Amy. I'm really happy to have you on the show today, and you're in Luxembourg, correct? Yeah, that's right. I'm right here in Luxembourg. Uh, actually, I'm sitting in my uh, office at the Luxembourg Natural History Museum, where I, I work as a paleontologist. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your job. How does a paleontologist end up organizing this great exhibit on the spirit of Shizen, Japan in 72 Seasons? I have to go back to my to my childhood uh, or to my teenage years. Uh, I always had two big passions uh, in my life. One was collecting fossils, so that's the paleontology part, and eventually it became my job. The other was a um, really deep interest into Japanese culture and especially the, um, the natural part, so uh, the garden culture, Japanese gardens, and uh, I started also growing bonsai when I was, uh, I think, 16 years old, and I never stopped since then. And uh, yeah, I have always been interested in, in Japanese garden uh, culture. So uh, it took me a while to, to, to get to Japan, actually. Uh, I was uh, 30 years old when I had my first travel to Japan. But the first thing I visited was uh, the, the bonsai village close to uh, Tokyo and, of course, some, some brilliant gardens in, in Kyoto, uh, especially. Yeah. So how many times have you been to Japan now? I made the count. Uh, it's exactly has been ni- nine times, <laughs> nine travels. And they were ranging from 10 days to up to uh, one month each time. Excellent. How did you go about curating this exhibition at the Museum of Natural History in Luxembourg? We were looking for um, an exhibition over summer. Uh, Here at the Natural History Museum, we usually have a, a longer exhibition that runs from October till May. And uh, then we have a shorter uh, summer exhibition, um, which often has a bit more artistic touch. So we sometimes had nature photographers, for example, and uh, we were looking for a topic. And uh, actually, um, there were some ideas, but nothing really convincing. So I just came up with an idea. I was telling myself, oh, isn't there an opportunity maybe to to link my my private passion about uh, Japanese nature uh, with my job. And uh, I made the proposal and it got accepted uh, by my colleagues. So we started working on this exhibition concept uh, a year ago. So at the beginning it was, uh, yeah, let's do something with Japanese nature, with with, uh, the seasons. And I was reading a book uh, actually about um, the old calendar, so the, the 72 uh, micro seasons, and uh, that was also the time I got into touch with uh, Mark Hovain, um, a Kyoto based garden designer, and uh, he's currently researching and writing a book about the 72 micro seasons in Japan. So I had a very good exchange uh, with Mark, and uh, actually, we developed the ground idea for the exhibition, the structure. We developed it together. So Mark was uh, kind of a uh, scientific advisor to, for this exhibition, and I'm the, the cu- curator. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, brief our audience on these 72 micro seasons. So basically, Japan has four seasons, uh, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And then there are the equinoxes, spring and autumn, and the solstices, which would be summer and winter, and others that are indicated at the beginning of each season. These are further broken down by themes according to natural events, such as rain, snow, insects, levels of heat, the progress of 
crops, as well as the cycles of plants and animals, bamboo shoots or the first peach blossoms or distant thunder, frogs croaking, warm winds blow. I think you get the idea. So the seasons are further broken down into the parts that are natural phenomena. And these are the 72 micro seasons of Japan. So, and Mark Horvain, he has one of, well, actually two, I believe, essays in the anthology, the catalog that goes along with the exhibit, right? Yes, exactly. So, our idea for the exhibition was, since the beginning, to make it not only an, uh, an exhibition that you can visit. So, we are showing, of course, uh, a lot of photographs, and we will maybe talk about that a bit later. Uh, we have also a movie that we produced about the seasons of Kyoto, but an important aspect is, uh, on one hand, uh, the, um, the site program, so the workshops we are organizing. And uh, for me personally, a very important aspect is the publication of, a, of an anthology that serves as an exhibition catalog. So it's not exactly reproducing what you will see in the exhibition. It's rather we contacted several experts and writers, both based in Japan and outside, and uh, we submitted them some proposals of topics that you will find also in the exhibition. Uh, one example is the 72 micro seasons. Another one is Ikebana, for example, um, talking about the two essays that were written by Mark Away. So this anthology gathers 17 writers and uh, garden experts or uh, photographers even that gives their, their um, yeah, that, that gives their opinion actually on a, on a selected topic. So we are trying to cover many aspects uh, of the, um, the relationship between Japanese culture and nature. Uh, of course, we cannot cover them all, so that's important to say. But I think we managed in um, uh, putting together an, an anthology that covers a wide array of, of topics. I got a advanced review copy and the anthology is full of stunning ph photographs taken by Kyoto-based photographer John Einerson. You have many also well-known writers in your anthology. Pico Iyer introduces each season with a short essay. And then we have Kawara, Kawahara da Mayumi, and she talks about the seasonal words in haiku poetry, the effects of nature on poetry of Matsuo Basho and uh, Maso Kashiki. And uh, Sebastian Razor explains some of the Japanese concepts that evolved around nature, sh such as yukioi, wabi-sabi, mono no aware. Naoko Abe, who wrote that great book on the ah, cherry yes. blossoms. Yeah. yeah. Um, Very, she, really brilliant, brilliant book, yeah. yeah. It really is a good book, and it was about the guy who brought the cherry blossoms to Europe, right, from Japan. She has an essay about Collingwood Ingram, who is an Englishman, and that whole story. And then Mark Peter Keane talks about Japanese gardens, including the dry garden, the Karesansi rock gardens. Bruce Hamana talks about the role of the seasons in the tea ceremony, Karen Lee Tawarayama talks about the use of moss in gardens and at temples. Edward Taylor discusses the rainy season. Rebecca Otoa, who also lives in the countryside and has written many books about Japan and traditional Japan. She talks about the autumn leaf viewing. And there's just all kinds of stuff in there, especially those uh, links that really layer the anthology by being able to relate the seasons to the other Japanese things, such as haiku poetry and tea ceremony and gardens and such. It's really quite comprehensive. Yeah, uh, for me personally, the fascinating thing about Japan and is that the traditional culture is so, um, so strongly linked with the, the seasons, actually. I mean, it's very obvious in, in haiku, as you know, in, in, in the traditional haiku, um, it's mandatory to have a seasonal word, uh, the, the kigo, and um, that's, uh, yeah, that's, as you mentioned, uh, Mayumi Kawaharada will uh, talks about it in, in her essay. Of course, you have traditional arts like, uh, such as bonsai or ikebana that are very obviously linked to nature. Um, then something maybe less, obvious to the general public is uh, the tea ceremony, but in the tea ceremony, 
Uh, of course, talking about tea, you have different types of tea according to the season. And most importantly, uh, you have different types of uh, Japanese sweets, the wagashi, which are uh, accordingly to the, to the season. Seasonality and the passing of time and also some kind of slight melancholy that is coming with it is really, really the, the, at the heart of Japanese culture. And, uh, I, and that's really a fascinating thing. I mean, you find uh, connections with nature in all traditional cultures, not only in Japan. Uh, but uh, I, I really think that uh, in Japan, um, also um, the, the traditional arts and the, um, the poetry and has really this, this very, very intimate link with the natural world and, and the passing of time, uh, that, which is exemplified by, by the, the, the changing seasons. And uh, obviously, the best known example also to our public in Luxembourg will be the, the hanami, the, uh, the flower viewing for, uh, for spring when the, the cherry blossoms are, are blossoming. That's something that everyone actually knows about, even if one's not very familiar with Japanese culture. So that's a very obvious example. But there are many, many, many other examples uh, to be found. Yes, and even in something like a traditional Japanese tea ceremony, it's the setting of the tea ceremony as well that's connected to nature. So, of course, all of the materials that one uses to make tea are made out of natural materials, bamboo whisks and such. But also, you will have your tokonoma, the because in your tea room, you'll have a tokonoma, and inside the tokonoma will be a scroll, and the scroll will, scroll will have a seasonal motif on it. The typical tea house also, if it's a dedicated tea house, will be surrounded by nature. So it's quite pleasant, and it's lovely that Japan keeps all these traditions, and that you can go to a, like a park, and they will have a tea room there and they'll be holding tea ceremonies throughout the the months and such so it it is quite special i think and the fact that they've preserved all these things it's wonderful and of course the cherry blossoms i think by now are worldwide <laughs> the the parties under the cherry uh, yeah. blossoms we organized one in luxembourg um with some people from the japanese embassy it was brilliant we were close by the moselle which is the biggest river here it was really like in Japan. We had the picnic, it's traditional food, and it was, it was great. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the exhibit itself then? You said you had some workshops. So people who do want to go to the Natural History Museum, what can they expect? So first of all, I, I would like to say that the situation concerning COVID is, is really good now, at least for the summer. It will stay like that. So we have basically no restrictions at all, uh, at least here in Luxembourg and in most European countries. And that's also maybe why I got notice from several people based abroad uh, that told me they would like to come to Luxembourg and they actually will. So we have people traveling to Europe uh, and Luxembourg from, from Kyoto, Japan. Uh, we will have people from London, from Paris that, uh, that, that will come to Luxembourg uh, to see the exhibition and maybe participate in, in a workshop. So from that point of view, really, there's no restrictions on traveling for this summer to be expected. The Luxembourg Natural History Museum, for people who are familiar, is uh, based in an, in an historical building in the old town of Luxembourg, so a very lovely setting. It's a rather small building, so the exhibition takes place on an entire floor. I would say you can visit it in around an hour, so it's not an extremely big exhibition. But of course, it can be a bit longer because, for example, we have a, a movie about the seasons of Kyoto that has been filmed by Kyoto-based uh, Felicity uh, Tilak. So it was produced for, for the exhibition on purpose. And this movie is uh, 15 minutes long. So and it will be uh, shown in a setting uh, of, um, yeah, we will try to imitate a bit the atmosphere of a tea house. So there's a little room with a screen and you step into it uh, on, on a kind of tatami mat. You have to take your shoes off. So it's all about taking your time, being in the present moment, enjoying the moment, and the nice images, the nice music. So I really invite people to take that, to come to the museum and take their time, count a bit around one hour, one hour 30 for the exhibition. And of course, after that, you are invited to have a tea in, in our lovely museum garden. We have an, uh, a lovely rock and uh, garden. 
uh, close to the river. And so you can easily spend two hours in, in the museum for people that, that want to, to visit. And then on the other hand, we have a, a really a good program, I think, uh, of workshops and conferences. Uh, you will be able to um, to attend uh, workshops about uh, calligraphy by Japanese artist Rie Takeda. She is based in, in Germany. She will come over for a whole day of workshops. And she did also the, um, the design for our exhibition poster uh, for the graphics. And uh, we will have uh, workshops, conferences covering uh, the theme of Ikebana, uh, the bonsai, also, we will have a Buddhist nun uh, from France, Kankyo Tanye. She uh, is a Zen uh, Buddhist nun, and she will give a, a talk about um, the seasons in, in Zen Buddhism. That will be very interesting too. She's also author of books that have been translated in over 10 uh, countries. Uh, we will have photography workshop with John Einerson from Kyoto, which, who will come over to Luxembourg about Mixang contemplative uh, photography. We will have online conferences by Mark Hovain about the 72 seasons and Bruce Hamana about the seasonality in uh, tea ceremony. We will have a, a pop-up tea house in our garden for a whole weekend. So there's really a lot of things to do and uh, a lot of workshops. And we have a gastronomic event in collaboration with the oldest Japanese restaurant here in Luxembourg. There will be food uh, and there will be a lot of information about the role of the seasons in Japanese uh, cuisine. So we, we cover basically a lot of aspects and uh, all this over a time period of uh, two months because the exhibition opens on the 1st of July and ends at the last day of August. Well, that sounds really full. That's great. And I presume that at the museum you will have copies of the anthology on sale? Exactly. So uh, the anthology will be ready for the opening, which is uh, on the end of June, and it will be sold at the museum shop. And uh, we will also probably give the possibility to order it from, uh, from abroad. There will be an, uh, a page on our website, price of 15 euros, which is quite uh, a low price. We wanted to, uh, to have it uh, at that price so that uh, at, as many people as possible can, uh, can enjoy it. Okay, I'll put that link up on the show notes to this episode of the podcast for anyone who's um, interested yeah. in ordering it. I always like to ask people at the end of the show, ask our guests what their three favorite books on Japan are. I have to say I am collecting books about about Japan, or link it uh, with Japan. So my, my, my flat is full of books uh, linked to Japan and especially to Kyoto, which is my, needless to say, my favorite place in Japan. Uh, so I am really collecting everything related to Kyoto. I, I will buy it. <laughs> and there are a lot of books about Kyoto. <laughs> so the, my first pick would be uh, an, one of the best books, in my opinion, that has been written about Kyoto. It is by Pico Aya, uh, The Lady and the Monk, Four Seasons in Kyoto. So there we have the link with, with the seasons, obviously. And I think it's a brilliant book. Uh, it's the first book that I read from Pico Aya. Since then, I read everything. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. And, um, and those who don't know him yet, Pico Aya lives uh, part of the year close to Kyoto in, in Nara City. And uh, in this book, he talks about his first year in Japan and also about how he met the lady, which later be would become his wife. It's a nice story. And it's well written and I really recommend it. Is he going to come to the exhibit? I didn't ask him the question. So as we mentioned, he, he wrote four texts, uh, four essays, which you will find in the anthology, but also printed in inside the exhibition. So they are really important for us. And I'm very honored that he accepted to do that. I know he's very busy, <laughs> so I'm not sure if he will be able to, to, to come to Europe. I didn't ask him the question yet, but I actually, uh, certainly will, will ask him the question. <laughs> and it would, of course, be very nice to, to see him here. Uh, second book is uh, one of the first books that I have read from a Japanese author. I read it uh, in my early 20s, and um, I was a huge fan then. I'm still a fan, and uh, the author is Haruki Murakami. And uh, the book is one maybe of his lesser-known books, uh, I guess. 
the title is uh, South of the Border, uh, oh. West of the Sun. Yeah. yeah, that's a great book. That's my favorite. And uh, I have to say many people um, like Murakami because of uh, books like Kafka on the Shore, where there are kind of supernatural elements in it. Personally, I don't like that. <laughs> I like the more realistic writings. And so in this book, he keeps it more simple. It's a very simple story. It's also kind of short story. But to, for me, it was very touching. And um, I think I read it seven or eight times and I still keep reading it from time to time. And I brought it with me to Japan uh, in all my travels. Okay, and number three? Yeah, number three is, so uh, maybe uh, English listeners are less familiar with uh, French author that I really like. His name is Nicolas Buvier. He lived uh, for a couple of years in Japan in the 60s, so quite some time ago. And he has uh, written several books about his experience in Japan. One of those books uh, has been translated into English, and the name, the title is uh, The Japanese Chronicles. Um, yeah, uh, Nicolas Buvier is really a, tr a traveler for me. It's um, an, an example. I really love his uh, writing and his approach to travel and his approach to life. Uh, he's a very good observer. He actually came, the story as how he came to Japan is quite interesting. Uh, he left. He left in the end of the 50s with his friend uh, and uh, with his uh, Fiat car. They left uh, Switzerland, where he's originally from, from Geneva, and they traveled uh, towards India uh, by car. So it took them two years, and uh, there's a book that has been published about this, this journey. Uh, it's uh, called it in English, The Way of the World. It's a classic in French travel literature. I really recommend it. But in this book, he doesn't cover the period, the Japanese period. Uh, so he arrives until India, until Sri Lanka, Ceylon. And there he, uh, he went into a kind of depression, nervous breakdown, uh, really uh, a very bad period. He got sick, he got fever, everything. And uh, somehow uh, he got salvation by a boat ticket to Yokohama in Japan. And so he took uh, the ride to Japan and then he stayed there. He stayed there for over a year and he resided in Tokyo first and later in Kyoto in, uh, in a sub-temple of Daitokuji. And uh, really Japan kind of saved his life. It uh, gave him a lot of inspiration and his experience is narrated in the Japanese chronicles. And I really recommend that, that, uh, that reading too. Okay, wow, that sounds like a fantastic story. <laughs> So thank you very much, Robert. I hope that many people will come to the Natural History Museum this summer in Luxembourg and see the Spirit of Shizen exhibit. And I wish you the best of luck with that. And thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to the Books on Asia podcast, produced and edited by Amy Chavez and Michael Palmer. Logo by Alex Kerr. Sponsored by Stonebridge Press publisher of Fine Books on Asia for over 30 years. They can be found at www.stonebridge.com. Look for their upcoming release, Kyoto Stories by Steve Alpert. An American student in 1970s Kyoto rambles among the city's beauties and traditions, learning as he goes. And I'm your podcast host, Amy Chavez, author of Amy's Guide to Best Behavior in Japan and the Widow, the Priest, and the Octopus Hunter, discovering a lost way of life on a secluded Japanese island. For more interviews, book reviews, and other features, visit the Books on Asia website at booksonasia.net.